knowledge of Genesis and Regenesis is the only true knowledge. This is from the Hermetic teachings that I got from the book by Isha Schwaller de Lubix. It's basically saying that everything that you know is true or you think or you think is true is actually all boiled down to one type of knowledge the only true knowledge which is the knowledge of your own regenesis or your own genesis and genesis simply means to grow to recreate reproduce and grow also known as fecundity so today we're going to talk about words, the power of language, and it's an incredibly dense topic, so it might change your, your paradigm, might change your point of view. But um, the great psychiatrist Thomas Saws, in his book um, on the meaning of mind, he states that mind itself has nothing in it except pure potential or potential energy and in order for the mind to cause manifest or function it has to have an image a symbol or some sort of icon and those images and symbols are what we call language so this video is about language and the power of language and Quoting Carlos Castaneda's work on the Toltec, he says that uh, our internal dialogue is what actually kindles and upholds reality. So a lot of people would, would just take that statement as being sort of uh, trivial. But if you really, really, really look deep inside the nature of mind or the nature of consciousness, you'll find that it's actually not trivial at all. It's actually perfectly relevant. Our internal dialogue, whether it be conscious or unconscious, is what actually makes reality appear to us as it does. So reality upholds our language or our symbols or our words that happen with inside of us, known as the internal dialogue. What do you mean? You talk to yourself too much. You're not unique at that. Every one of us does that. We carry on an internal talk. Think about it. Whenever you are alone, what do you do? I talk to myself. What do you talk to yourself about? I don't know anything, I suppose. I'll tell you what we talk to ourselves about. We talk about our world. In fact, we maintain our world with our internal talk. How do we do that? Whenever we finish talking to ourselves, the world is always as it should be. We renew it. We kindle it with life. We uphold it with our internal talk. Not only that, but we also choose our paths as we talk to ourselves. Thus we repeat the same choices over and over until the day we die, because we keep on repeating the same internal talk over and over until the day we die. So a lot of people, most people don't realize their internal dialogue, they don't even realize it's going on, so they're unconscious of it. The point in this video is to make you more conscious of it in a very esoteric way. The use of words and language is incredibly powerful in uh, projecting and upholding your reality. And so it's been said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, and the Word was God. So what does this mean? First of all, before we answer that question, Take a step back and realize that this statement was written. It was written. It was written in words. So not only are we using language to talk about language, we have to realize that using language to talk about language evolves language, which means it evolves our reality. So notice that when it's talking about God or spirit, and this is not just from biblical scripture, it's from almost all scriptures. From the Tibetan to the Egyptian to the Christian to the Sanskrit Vedas. It always talks about the word. 
meaning sound. So what they're saying is that consciousness uses sound to create symbol and symbol to create what we would call a letter and letter to create words and words to create reality. So the power, this video is about the power of words. It's incredibly powerful when you wrap your mind around it. Um, so think about it. It's also been said in biblical scriptures that, uh, that it has been written in the book of life that man shall endure forevermore. So let's extrapolate and unpack that. What's the book of life? It's actually you, your body. The human body is the book of life. It's been written, okay, which means it has to be in symbol, letter, word that you, man, human, shall endure forevermore. Who wrote it? Well, in the beginning was the Word. So, if it's been written in the Book of Life that we shall endure forevermore, that means at some place deep inside our consciousness, some of us are aware that we are actually eternal. Bold statement, I know. But consciousness can become aware of itself. It's a maneuver, it's a, an evolutionary maneuver, it's, a, it's an unfoldment within itself. And so men along the ways, the great saints and sages of all traditions, of all true traditions, have maintained that we actually are eternal and we have access to the awareness of the eternity within. And I'm here to point to the idea that act, this type of access uh, has been dictated to a great deal by our internal dialogue and also that word and language is a double-edged sword, so to speak. It's an incredibly powerful tool um, to progress consciousness and to change our reality. It's also an incredibly destructive tool when it's used unconsciously. So, here we go. All right, so, this, is, this topic is pretty interesting. Um, according to William, uh, Lawrence William Lyons, who wrote an amazing book, incredible mind-blowing book called The Language Crystal, he's gone back and shown that the way in which the human mind and psyche has worked over time has drastically shifted from the moment that mankind was able to harness fire. Fire is an icon or a meaning of technology. So, since fire, which man ultimately feared in the beginning, once he got enough curiosity to get close enough to it, look at it, bring it back to the village, harness it, use it, his fear transformed. Um, we still have a deep-seated psychological fear of fire. There's no doubt about it. It's in our psyche. But the point is that William Lyons is making is that when man started to use technology, something that is neutral, he, did, he could use it for good, like say heating the house or the cave or the village or curing and making cured bricks. Uh, or You know, there's all kinds of tools you can use fire for, or technological uses to use fire. But over time, man decided to wield fire against other men. And this is when technology went awry. And so it's still happening today with the use of weaponry, nuclear bombs, um, war 
uh, explosive based technology. It's all very destructive, not only to the physical human, but to the human psyche. So what he's saying is, is that our history did not exist before we wielded fire. And it actually makes perfect sense if you think about it. Our language, which, which originally comes out of grunts and tones and moans and, and sounds that the human being makes, which we had language before the use of technology or fire, but it wasn't written down. So here's the key point. He's saying that in our psyche, a trauma happened, which actually gave rise to a different type of identity, which, which strengthened our ego. Our ego is our I or our identity, what we identify with in the mind. So what he's saying is, is that before we wielded fire as a technology, we had language, but we didn't have symbols. We didn't have letters and we didn't have alphabets. So we didn't use images in order to store information. And this is the key point. He's saying that since we created an alphabet, we were able to create images, symbols, and words eventually. And we were able to store our emotions in those symbols and carry them with us throughout life and also deal with them at a different time. So. The key point to get here is that animals, although they have language, they don't have alphabets. They don't have words that are written as symbols. So their psyche doesn't work like ours. They're not able to manifest reality via the power of the word like human beings are. So what we do when we create a word is we store a feeling or an emotion with that word. So for example, anger. I'm angry, right? Well, if you're, if you're an animal without lexicon, if you're an animal without words, you might feel anger if you're being attacked. But you only feel it in that moment when survival is paramount. And when survival is, is when you've gone through the attack and you've, you've made it out the other side and you've survived, that feeling, that emotion of anger, it, it disappears immediately. But man, we actually hold on to those feelings. They're encoded quite literally in the body, in the mind, in the psyche, because we've created a way in which to, uh, to carry that emotion. We carry it through images, symbols, letters, and words. And so it's, it's a really, really heavy idea to think about, but the power of words can heal us and release us from what we've stored up. It can also cause more repression. So repression is when you uh, forget about what you've already forgotten about. So if you forget something and then you remember it, it's no longer uh, hidden. But if you forget something and you don't remember it, and then you forget that you forgot well, that becomes repression. Repression, the word repression is re, to do again, press, pression. So instead of decompression, which would be the opposite, you're recompressing. So here I'm just gonna point out the, the paramount things in the language that we use in the Western world. And this, as far as to my knowledge, this only applies to Western language with these particular letters. Um, the same thing applies to all language, but I'm not a linguist, so I haven't studied all these different languages. But I do know that in the Romance languages, in the Indo-European root languages, um, Latin, Greek, uh, even Coptic, and parts of Aramaic, um, even into the Celtic, and um, obviously into English, which is what I'm using now, it, it does apply. So what I'm going to point out is that, first of all, the human mind known to be dyslexic, we've been taught this is a bad thing. Dyslexia is actually a good thing. It's actually a part of the right brain of the human being. And a lot of very artistic, creative, um, genius types 
and savant types and even autistic types have this dyslexic thing going on and we've been taught that it's bad um, a matter of fact the word dyslexic actually means dis means bad and lex means word so it actually has been termed bad word but it's not true it's not a bad word dyslexia is not bad what it is is it's actually the way in which our mind works is uh, it, especially through images and symbols which become language it becomes it's mirror like so it's reflective like or lens like so the dyslexia that occurs is actually something in in our species evolution to actually help us survive and Lyons the author of this book the language crystal basically proves that so what I'm getting at is that our language over our written history has these rules that you have to understand first when I present this and those rules are that that words can be acronyms or symbols can be acronyms they can be reversed or mirrored and letters can also uh, be reversed or mirrored and also the sounds that come from those letters can be reversed or mirrored and they still hold the same intrinsic meaning depending on how you use it in context so what I mean by that is for example, Ra, R-A, is obviously the sun god in ancient Egypt. But all these words that have this Ra etymological root meaning mean the same thing. So Ra, Re, Re, Ro, Ru, and R, which is just Ra spelled backwards, they all carry the same, the same meaning, which is um, Ra refers to the sun, which basically means royal, kingly, light, or power it refers to the morning sun. And this is why you have words like Roy. The name Roy means kingly. Um, my name Ryan, Rai, R Y, the same thing. It means king. Um, Ri in Japanese means power. Um, ro is the root word of to rotate, to continue on, to move forward. All refers to power. And then you can also do the same thing with L. So this is Ra. An L, which actually refers to Israel. This is why Israel is such this weird talismanic term. Um, Israel is three Egyptian gods, Isis, Ra, and El. And those gods are actually very powerful, but what you have to understand is that they're not beings. Those gods are cosmic principles. And in this case, those gods or cosmic principles are principles in manifesting reality and those principles are letter tones or sounds or symbols that became known to the human being as being able to manifest reality and this is why um, we go over to L and EL is the same as LE so the meaning of the root for L is Elohim which means messenger or angel or messenger of light. But throughout language, these all mean the same thing. Lo, lu, li, la, le, el. They all mean the same thing. And they refer to light. Um, and you'll see these roots throughout English constantly. And depending on how you look at them, depending on how dyslexic you are, you'll be able to ascertain the etymological root meaning of many, many words. And so to point at that, I would like to show you that, for example, you'll see R at the end of a word, um, and you'll see it switched with L in other words, and you see the difference between the meanings of these words. What's the difference between the word anger and angel? Wow, huge difference, right? One is very negative, and one is destructive, and one is very positive and um, enlightening or illuminating. It's the exact same word, A-N-G, A-N-G. And then the only thing that's switched or reversed is the R and the E, which, which is actually L. The R and the L, E-L, meaning L. And just those particular modifications change the entire meaning of the word. And this is what I'm trying to get across, and this is what's so brilliantly portrayed in this book, um, The Language Crystal. 
The same thing happens where we talk about fire, the original technology that man wielded. Well, first fire, the word fire, in its original tone was fear, because we feared it. We were terrified of it. It was spiritual, dynamic, destructive. You couldn't go too close to it. It was terrifying. So we feared it. But over time, it became, instead of fear, it became fire. So what has changed? Well, the R is in a different place. The R is not quite at the end. It's just before the end. So fear and fire, they have totally different meanings, but they stem from the original root of the same tone. And this goes on throughout our entire language, and it's, a, it's an exercise that you have to really study in order to, to uh, understand, and I'm just, I'm just at the beginning of this, so I'm by no means an expert, but it is fascinating. Um, for example, another interesting word that we use a lot is confusion. It has a negative connotation. Oh, you know, what does it mean to be confused? Well, what does the word etymologically actually mean? We need to realize that. It means with fusion. Fusion means to actually bring together. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. So you can see how our words have gotten talismanized and have gotten changed over time. And what we need to do is reclaim the power of our words and understand what they actually truly originally meant for the human being as a tone or as a symbol. And we need to start using them correctly because this is actually a way to change the world, change consciousness within each individual person because your internal dialogue, whether you realize it or not, is actually reflected in the reality that you participate in. And if you're using words that um, in the wrong way and you don't actually understand their meaning, your reality is going to be reflected in that way unconsciously. And you'll wonder, you know, you'll wonder why you're so angry or things aren't going well for you. Um, a really interesting way to show this is the difference between healing, which is H-E-A-L, is really no different. If you want to heal, you need to hear. So here we are again. The only thing that's changed is the L and the R. If you want to heal, you need to be able to hear what's actually being said. You need to understand the actual tone and symbol and letter and its meaning. And they say that you know a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a picture is just a symbol. And, and a symbol is worth a thousand words. But understanding the actual root meaning of the symbol in nature is extremely powerful. And so I'll go through some more words and, and show you how this works. But before I do, I'm going to read a little bit about consciousness from R. H. Waller de Lubix, talking about the passage of consciousness in the human being. So, form is the crystallization of specificity. Specificity cannot change without destruction of form. This is the work of life. That is to say, destruction through natural decomposition and reorganization or reconstitution of a new form. So right there, what he's telling you is that crystallization is something that is specified and it cannot change without destruction of that specificity or of that form. So consciousness creates form. And consciousness creates form through tone or sound, which eventually becomes the word. So this is the work of life. So this is why our internal dialogue is so incredibly powerful. And in order to deconstruct that and reorganize it into a new form, we have to, we have to change our words. We have to understand their meaning, or we could actually recreate their meaning. But we have to be very, very aware of the spell that we're placing upon ourselves. And that's why, when it comes to words, casting a spell is actually what we call spelling. So what you have to understand is that 
in order to be to be powerful enough to cast a spell in the old days, you had to, to know symbols, letters, and words. And not everybody was literate. Matter of fact, very few people were literate. So they could use words and speak words, and they would be casting a spell on their own psyche and just not be aware of it. And the, the people with power that were the people that had the awareness of how to create words and how to spell them. So my point here is be aware that you're constantly casting a spell upon yourself and those around you based on the way in which you use your tones, symbols, symbols, and words. Schwaller de Lubix goes on to say, this reconstitution requires a ferment, which is a seed. This ferment is the fixed point which is the essence or center of everything. And I'd like to say that this fixed point or center of everything is, is, the, is the symbol in this case. It's whatever the mind has chosen to identify with and to cast forth or manifest. And in this conversation, I'm talking about mind or consciousness using symbols to create reality. Through the corporal life between birth and death, influences or sufferings can modify this fixed center and this will at the time of reconstitution modify the specificity so what he's saying right here is is that anything in form through corporal life which means bodily life which is us walking around in a body this fixed point through birth and death and the influences of suffering can change this specificity or change this fixed point and what he's basically saying here is that you can either become aware of that change and start to wield it, wield it yourself with your own intent, the use of your words, and the language that you choose, and the practices that you, you do in your life. Um, or you can remain unconscious of it, and it will just appear that life happens to you and that you have no control over it. But what he's pointing out here is consciousness is basically able to be a, become aware of itself to measure itself and that the more one practices in becoming aware of oneself the more conscious we become so this creates evolution thus evolution can only be produced by suffering that is to say profound affectation inscribing itself in the fixed point the indestructible nucleus whether this be an organized being or an inorganic thing. So to summarize what he's saying there is that this is how consciousness evolves. And it's interesting that when we talk about evolution, let's see here, where, where are these things? When we talk about evolution, well, the word evolve, the root word for evil, not evil, but evolve, is just love spelled backwards. Love. So love is ever, ever interconnected evolution. That's the whole point. Love is, is eternally moving us into new, newer and greater states of consciousness or self-awareness or interconnectivity. Love is evolution. Um, so remember I said that you have to be able to understand that the dyslexia of the mind is not a bad thing these things are actually meant to be anagrams, meant to be mirrored, meant to be reversed, because that's the way the human mind works. And if you've never heard this before, read a book um, by Julian Jaynes called uh, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, where he talks about the nature of our, our brain, or our mind, I should say our mind, um, has a dualistic nature meaning bicameral, meaning two views. So we could say left and right brains. So here we have again, left and right. L is left, Ra is right. See, this is not a coincidence. This is the way nature built us. We have a left and a right side. We're bifurcated, we're split down the middle. We're dualistic in the physical form, but in the mind, we're not dualistic. We are actually unified. As soon as we become conscious of this or aware of this, so, 
Julian Jaynes in the breakdown of the bicameral mind is saying that before we had language written down, so before we had written history, we still had language, but our brain functioned differently to where we could actually, um, our left brain and our right brain would speak to each other and it would feel to us as if we were hearing a voice from outside ourselves, meaning like, a spirit was talking to us and what he's saying is is that over time through language writing and symbol our fo our focus has shifted from a bicameral mind to a unicameral mind or closer to a unicameral mind meaning only one side is talking at a time meaning you might be stuck in the left brain and just super intellectual and chopping, chopping up reality in small little pieces and thinking that that's what all of reality is. Or you might be on the other side and be a very right brain person and be incredibly intuitive um, and, you know, I guess you could say open-minded to where there's not a lot of uh, compartmentalizing and there's not a lot of intellectualizing and there's not a lot of chopping up reality. But you also don't have the ability to organize very well. So the left and the right brain need to work together, obviously. And the way in which we get, get to that is through the middle path, right? The metaphysics. The middle physics, or also meta means beyond. So the beyond physics. The middle way, the Zen, which is basically, it comes down to balance. Balanced awareness, balanced thinking. Left and right brain working together. So we still have a bicameral aspect to us, and we still have a unified as aspect to us. The point is to be able to be aware of both of them in your life. And I'm telling you right now that language is an incredible way to become aware of that if you practice it.